Hello and thank you for tuning in. This is a talk I was supposed to give at Sim UQ and like the rest of our symposia and in fact the entire conference it has unfortunately been cancelled. It's a talk about, of course, uncertainty, a topic not just at the heart of um, the UQ community but also maybe of interest to the entire world right now. But it's about a very specific kind of uncertainty, computational uncertainty. A kind of uncertainty that, according to many people, doesn't seem to exist. To this day, we keep getting told, often by reviewers, that computational uncertainty is not a thing. That the only source of uncertainty, and this is coming from people in the UQ community, the only source of uncertainty is uncertainty from ill-posedness, so uncertainty caused by a lack of data. What I want to convince you of with this talk is that this is not right anymore and that this is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. So up until maybe a few decades ago, the prevailing notion, and in fact actually maybe that's still the prevailing notion in numerical analysis, was that a computer actually computes the numbers it's supposed to compute. So if you're trying to solve a numerical problem, you ask the computer to compute a certain value of uh, some target function, and then the computer actually computes that number to very high numerical precision. By high precision, I mean that the error in the computation is small compared to the value of the number being computed. Now, in contemporary computing, I mean, I, I would say numerical computing or scientific computing or computer science, but it's all just all of computing, actually. This is not always true anymore. And this is due to the rise of data. Let's pick machine learning as the problem to work with. But what I'm going to describe to you is not just a specific problem of machine learning. It's true for all data centric computing. The typical setting in these domains is that there is some function, let's call it L for the loss function, and you might want to minimize that function or do any other numerical task with it. We'll talk about a few more later. You can also often, in a probabilistic sense, think of that loss function as a negative log likelihood of some model, but it doesn't have to be necessarily. What is very often the case in these models is that they are essentially that they amount to exchangeable models in the sense that they um, have the form that this loss function is a sum over individual terms where each term depends on one datum and on all the parameters of the model. And the parameters are the quantity of interest for the numerical computation. Now, if the data set is large, and let's face it, in um, today's world, most data sets are large. So if n is a very large number, then when your numerical algorithm, whether it's an optimizer or a simulator or an integrator or whatever, when it asks you to compute this quantity, you will often not be able to go through the entire big sum because it just takes way too long. So what people do instead is they choose a batch, so they draw a much smaller number of data from the entire corpus. Maybe they manage to do that in an IID fashion. Maybe it's a data stream and you just take the more, the more uh, recent data points and compute this much smaller sum over a smaller batch. Now, if you manage to draw the batch IID, which is often an assumption being made, then what you get here is a random number that is an unbiased estimator of the correct loss. But it's not just unbiased. By the central limit theorem, it's approximately Gaussian distributed around the true loss function. So by around, I mean this random number has a mean that is given by the thing we're actually trying to compute. But it also has a non-trivial error, a variance. And that variance scales with uh, inversely with the size of the batch. Now, the challenge now is that in contrast to many classic numerical problems, or actually all classic numerical problems, in contemporary machine learning and data-centric computing, it's often the case that this batch is quite small and that the square root of this variance, 
so the error bar essentially, is as large or even larger than the mean, the quantity we're actually trying to compute. So the signal to noise ratio is less than one. And this is a huge problem because it essentially invalidates how we think about numerical methods. So classically, a numerical method is defined as an algorithm that runs on the number that it actually computes. It doesn't take uncertainty into account. And then there is a post hoc step called stability analysis, where you check whether, or sensitivity analysis if you like, where you check whether the method um, uh, is reliable by making a local ex expansion, a local approximation around the two value. But that only works if the disturbance is small compared to the correct value. If the error is of the same size or even larger than the true value, then many things don't work anymore. So let me use a case study, an example, to show you what I mean by this. And I'll pick optimization because optimization is the maybe currently most important operation in machine learning and much of data analysis, but it's not the only one. So I'll come back to a few more examples later on. So I will drastically simplify everything and let's stick with our example. We have some loss function L, which we, cannot uh, which we can exactly compute. So let's assume for a moment that we actually can exactly compute it and look at how we would do this in a classical sense. And then I will come back to think about what uncertainty actually causes, what kind of problems uncertainty causes in these settings. So let's say we want to find the minimum of this loss function, so the root of this gradient. We want to design some dynamical process which updates an estimate for these parameters theta in each step by taking a step in a direction given by a vector st and scaled by a scale, a scalar at. Now, let's assume it's 30 years ago and we actually can reasonably confidently assume that the number we're actually computing is the correct gradient. Then how do we solve this problem? So apologies to everyone in the room, because of course I know that you all know how optimization works. But let's just recall for ourselves what these processes actually are and why they might be susceptible to noise. So the first step might be, how do you, uh, let's even assume we know which direction we want to step into. How do we set the step size, which you might call the learning rate or the step size? Well, there's a simple answer that you can actually find in the appendices of textbooks like Bertzekas, or in the opening chapters of a textbook like Nostradamus and Wright, and it's called a line search. So you keep the, st the step direction constant, then that means you're now essentially solving a one-dimensional problem, and you do a bit of a search. So you take an initial step and then extend that step in an exponential fashion until you reach a point where the gradient has flipped, and then you do a spline interpolation. So you, you uh, uh, draw sort of, uh, you can think of a line being drawn that smoothly connects these two points and go to the minimum of it. And then if you still haven't converged, keep doing this until you reach a point where the gradient is sufficiently flat and the function value is sufficiently low. So these are the two so-called Wolf conditions to terminate this search process. And then you know what your step size is. Fine, that's an easy, simple algorithm. How do you choose your search direction? Well, you essentially do the same thing, but in a multivariate version, which is to do interpolation. So um, how do you choose the, the search direction? Well, one, of course, there are many possible ways of doing this, but one way to do it would be to um, use the sequence of collected gradients to estimate the curvature of the loss function which you can because you get a sequence of gradients, so you can estimate the change of the gradient, which is given by the Hessian function. So we're going to construct an estimate for the Hessian, let's call it B, by um, imposing a constraint that our Hessian estimate has to fulfill this so-called second equation. So this is, that's a linear interpolation on the gradient or a quadratic interpolation on the loss function, similar to what we did for the line search, but now in multivariates, uh, in the multivariate setting. Now, of course, this one-dimensional rank one observation is not sufficient to estimate the entire Hessian, 
So we will do some kind of regularization. We want our new estimate to be close to the old estimate in, uh, as measured by some Frobenius norm. If you choose the Frobenius norm right, then you get an um, estimate for the Hessian that is reasonably interesting and you can invert it efficiently and estimate what the Newton direction might be. This is essentially learning the Hessian in an inference, a regularized empirical risk minimization setting. And this idea is associated with these four chaps. They are called Broyden, Fletcher, Goldfarb and Shano. And they have been immortalized in the abbreviation BFGS that um, most of you will know. And you can tell from the attire that these people are wearing that this is anything but a new idea. In fact, it was done in the 1970s and late 60s even. So it's a really, really old idea, but it has stood the test of time for quite some decades and produced really highly performant optimizers. But unfortunately, these methods are unstable to noise and I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's maybe in passing, Look at uh, something that might seem almost, almost trivial. How do you actually stop an optimizer? Well, in the noise-free case, you don't have to worry about this. You just run it until the gradient is zero. And if the problem is sufficiently regular, that's going to happen eventually, or it's almost zero, like less than machine precision, and you just stop, right? Fine, okay. So that's the situation at the, early, at the beginning of the 20th, 21st century. Now let's assume, no, let's think again how all of this changes if we cannot compute the gradient exactly anymore, but we only have access to this estimator L hat, which let's for simplicity, and that's actually a simplification. In reality, it's a bit more complicated, but let's for simplicity assume that the, this is actually a random number that's approximately Gaussian distributed with this mean and this covariance. And we don't know this covariance, right? We just have our estimator. estimator. Then, how do we choose our learning rate? Well, the answer is suddenly we don't know anymore because this idea of a line search doesn't trivially extend if you don't know what the error bar is, right? So what this picture is supposed to show is we have the same four numbers here, a function value and a gradient and another function value and a gradient, but we don't know what the error bars is, are, so I'm scaling them up and down in this animation. And you can see that um, if you now do a least squares estimate, that's the thick black line, then these observations support just about any hypothesis for the true loss function. It could have its minimum very far uh, at infinity over here, somewhere in between, or at infinity somewhere over here. Everything is essentially possible. So how should we choose our learning rate? We don't know. And in fact, this is a real problem in machine learning and it's the reason why highly paid engineers sit around at Google twisting knobs to try and set the learning rates. How should we search, um, choose our search directions now? How should we um, choose S? Well, the problem is that these quasi-Newton methods I just described, like BFGS, they do this interpolation and that's just unstable to this very significant kind of noise. Now, some of you watching this video might say, yes, but there are stochastic quasi-Newton methods and stochastic BFGS and so on. So it's, it's not really a, a, a big difference. Let me tell you, that's not true. No one in machine learning, in like real applied deep learning, uses stochastic quasi-Newton methods because they turn out to just be unstable to realistic, high-dimensional, very noisy, challenging deep learning problems. They might work on small-scale problems, but not on realistic problems. And this is a huge problem. It's not just about quasi-Newton methods. The entire applied math community has essentially stopped contributing to machine learning because why? Because of a lack of dealing with uncertainty. Computational uncertainty has made, has basically invalidated all of classic numerical analysis in this particular domain. And the people who have come, like with the community who has to, who has to use these algorithms is essentially left to fend on its own. And what this leads to is this kind of situation. There are there's now an entire zoo of new optimization methods that have sprung up over the past few years, all trying to stabilize stochastic gradient descent and provide meaningful hyperparameters to it, like learning rates. And um, nobody really knows what, what's the right answer because there's very little theory for it, because there is no fundamentally proper way yet to deal with this kind of uncertainty. So this is a list that was uh, collected by um, one of the PhD students in my group called Frank Schneider, together with a master student. They actually wrote a parser to um, 
scrape names of optimizers from the, the machine learning listings. And this is actually not the entire list. It's just the list from A to G because I couldn't get the entire list on this slide. It's just, otherwise it would just be too big. Maybe you've heard of methods like Adam, which are quite popular at the moment, but it's really just one point in a very long continuum of algorithms that people have developed. And no one really knows which of these is the best and why they are the best or not. In fact, if we're truly honest, I think people even disagree on what Adam actually is and why it works. And the reason for this is that uncertainty in computation is not fully understood. Just to drive home that point, let me mention an obvious thing. If you don't have access to noise-free gradients, you don't even know when you're done, right? Because even if you manage to reach the minimum, so even if you reach a point where the true gradient is zero, then those stochastic estimators, those random numbers you, are gonna, you're, you keep collecting for your gradient, will never be zero, almost surely, right? So if you run your optimizer on this, in a stochastic setting, eventually it'll go into diffusion around the true minimum, and you don't necessarily notice because you don't know what the noise is. So, to summarize, computational uncertainty is now integral to most scientific computation and data analysis, and it has essentially invalidated many classic numerical algorithms because these methods were developed um, without a direct role for uncertainty. To solve this issue, uncertainty has to become a part of the algorithm, not just its analysis. So stability analysis, of course, is an important tool and it's useful, but it's something that you do on a piece of paper to an algorithm that is already implemented and running. What we need are algorithms that actually have this uncertainty, which I called sigma on previous slides, as a parameter inside of themselves and use it and maybe even control it to improve their performance. So if you've been to some of my previous talks, you've seen examples of work from my own group on how to do this. And let me just flash them by you again. But the point of this talk is not to sell these methods. It's to sell this point that uncertainty is important. So if you know what this uncertainty sigma actually is, imagine that you have a numerical value for this quantity. Then you can do things like, for example, construct what we call the stochastic or probabilistic, excuse me, probabilistic line search. So um, you just construct essentially a regularized estimate for the shape of the loss function along this one dimensional search space. And then you become stable to this kind of noise and you can still actually compute uh, probabilistic beliefs over the, um, the whether the wolf conditions, the termination criteria are fulfilled or not and move to that, to, to this point. And you can even go beyond this and you can even start and try to control this variance. So there was a paper by um, uh, my PhD student, Lucas Balles, actually quite a long time ago already, which showed that you, once you have access to this quantity sigma, and of course you can control this, right, by scaling up or down the, the batch size, of course, you have to pay a price for that, right? The computation that becomes more or less expensive, but you can make reason about the expected improvement that a gradient descent optimizer has from taking such a step with a particular uh, variance and then actually control this variance such that um, you or control this parameter that controls the noise to get um, a good in performance in, uh, in optimization. So these are the solid bars in all of these problems here. So they are sort of below all the other lines. So that's a good thing. You can read more about this in this paper. And you can also even do statistical tests to decide whether your algorithm has converged or not. So this is actually stayed a tech report forever because the students have left now, unfortunately, and they've finished their degrees. But it's relatively straightforward, right? So if you have access to this quantity sigma, then you can construct something like a t-test to decide whether your algorithm um, now sees gradients that come from a zero mean Gaussian. And when this happens, you can then decide to stop. So what I wanted to show with this is that th th these are ways for actually making use of uncertainty explicitly or leveraging it explicitly by describing it inside of the algorithm. And this can be like very patently means that there is a new quantity that enters 
the flow of the algorithm and that has to be computed, this variance. Now, the natural question that arises is how expensive or how difficult is it to compute these quantities that we need to be able to control this process? And the story here, and that's going to be the final part of this talk, is a little bit tricky and I will use it to highlight some recent uh, results out of my group that I would like to, or actually they're almost little products that I would like to sell to you in this, in, in this talk. So um, the reason for this, I mean, maybe to, to cut the answer short, the answer is it's possible to get off these quantities, but you don't get them in, um, in the current software stack easily. They're actually cheap to compute on paper, but not so easy to get to in the way that machine learning is currently done. If you followed the flow of data center computing recently, then you might have noticed that maybe the biggest development of the past decade wasn't necessarily deep learning as such. It was the arrival, the, the um, development of um, automatic differentiation frameworks. So software tools which allow the user to um, automatically compute gradients of more or less general functions. There are now many such software tool tools available and they've massively simplified software design. People can now build very complicated models with automated gradients. And of course, this is, I mean, one of the main reasons why we see such elaborate deep learning models that people can just build these complicated models. So um, in terms of the notation that I've used for the first part of this talk, what, this, what the story behind this is, is that, so we, this is the quantity we actually care about for our numerical computation that I had on previous slides. Now, we've said that we can't compute this because n is large. So instead, we're going to estimate it with a cheap statistical estimator, which is unbiased and has a non-trivial variance. What these automated differentiation frameworks are based on is the insight that if you wanted to compute the gradient of this exact function or this stochastic estimator for it, then you need these individual gradients of these, um, of these loss terms. And as it turns out, there are theoretical results that show that computing elements of this gradient is actually um, cheap or it's as expensive roughly as computing this value. So computing one element of this gradient costs at most five times as much as computing one value of this function value. Now, um, of course, a gradient is a high dimensional object, a multivariate object, so it might be more expensive to do that. But um, parallelization on massively parallel hardware like graphical computer, like computing units comes to your help. And actually a large part of what these software packages allow you to do is to um, simplify this parallelization efficiently. Now, let's say that we're already using a piece of code that does this for us, that computes this quantity. Now, what I've argued in the previous part of this talk is that we also additionally would like to have an estimate for the error bars of the quantities in this gradient. So let's say we only care about the element-wise error bars, so variances of the elements of the gradient. How do we get those? Well, of course, you know how to get them. This is a mean estimate. We need to get a second moment estimate. So all we have to do is just square the elements of um, this sum. So that's clearly not expensive because the expensive part is computing the elements of this gradient using backpropagation or automatic differentiation. Once we have these and we've already computed them, we just need to square a bunch of numbers. That's not expensive, right? So it should really be very easy and add only a minimal overhead on the overall computation to get these square elements. Unfortunately though, these software tools make it not so easy to get to these kind of numbers because of the way that they are coded. They usually do the, um, the, uh, the, the collapsing, the summing out over the batch in an internal process that is not easily accessible to the user at the right time to get access to them. So here is where I'd like to sell you something new, some tool that you might want to use in your own research. If I've managed to excite you about looking at probabilistic quantities like the variance and of course other moments or other quantifications of uncertainty on the distribution in the batch as well, then you might want to have a look at this paper, which is going to be published in a few days at the ITO conference, which is also going to be a virtual conference this year. 
Um, you can also already find it on GitHub and you can install it with this simple, if you're a Python programmer, with this simple pip install command. It's a package which we call backpack because it's a backpack for the torch package which adds functionality to extract various quantities during the computation, in particular also all the individual gradients in the batch and therefore also, for example, their variance. And it does so very efficiently. So if this is the cost of computing the, in the, the batch mean gradient using PyTorch for different batch sizes, then this is the cost of computing with this new package the gradients and actually all the individual gradients in the batch or the variance for them. This is much, much cheaper than if you don't use efficient parallelization and just run a big for loop to do so. The code is written such that it's very easy to do this. So here is a piece of code that you would otherwise write to evaluate the loss function for this optimization problem. Here is the loss being computed, then a gradient is computed, and then it's printed out. With this new package, you just add the stuff in blue, which as you can see is not very much, to extend this computation and also additionally compute the variance or other quantities of interest with um, the like on top of the, the batch mean gradient. This package doesn't just allow you to compute variances, it also adds functionality for second order quantities that essentially give access to the geometry of the loss function and statistics over the geometry of the loss function. These are important, not just in optimization, but also in optimization because people are of course interested in second, type, second order type optimization methods. So by second order, I don't mean second order convergence, but second order quantities being computed, curvature, um, which are accessible by automatic differentiation. But these kind of quantities also matter in other settings. For example, since we are talking about numerics, they might be interesting to solve ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations where the same kind of uncertainty, of course, also shows up. That's so coming back to the more general setting. I'd like to remind you that optimization was only picked as an example. This is not specific to optimization. Data now plays a role beyond optimization in simulation, in the solution of ordinary differential equations, and in integration, because of course you might, be, you might want to be uncertain about the weights of your neural network and compute a marginal estimate over very many different weight settings or even architectures. And you might be uncertain about the solution of some dynamical system which is only described by some data. And then you might still have this subsampling issue. So the same kind of these issues also, like these tricks also extend in this backpack package beyond first order quantities towards second order quantities. If you want to find out more about this, have a look at the paper online. With that, I'm essentially at the end. I've uh, tried to convince you that uncertainty doesn't just arise from ill-posed problems. That's something that I very much hope the UQ community will accept after maybe this talk and a few more that might have to follow it. Computation itself can be uncertain. And this uncertainty can arise from subsampling relative to the full data setting. So it's not that your data set doesn't fully identify the problem. That's also a problem. But in your computation, you might only use a small part of the data set and that causes additional uncertainty in the computation itself. To address this issue, computational uncertainty has to become a first-class citizen. And by that, I mean that the uncertainty, statistics about the computation have to become part of the algorithm and not just its analysis. Stability analysis is fine, but in a setting where the error can be larger than the signal, it's not enough to, to study what's going on. To make algorithms stable and efficient in this setting, they have to use the statistics of the entire computation. And in fact, because we now have sources of uncertainty from different directions, from the data, from the computation, and from the model, all of these have to be tracked through the computation and the sources have to remain auditable through the path of the computation. I only know one mathematical framework to describe this setting in properly, and that's the probabilistic one, 
probabilistic numerics is therefore the answer to this problem, in my opinion. And I very much hope that our small community will rise to this occasion and make computational uncertainty a prime use case for probabilistic numerics. By the way, and this is something I would like to add at the end of this talk, thank you very much for listening if you've listened so far, but if you're someone who really wants to work in this domain, but you're, you feel that you're not fully up to the task of playing, playing around with deep learning because you haven't followed the field in a while, let me just shamelessly plug one more product from my group, which is called DeepOps, which is also very easy to install in your Python um, toolchain. And it's a, it's a package written by uh, Frank Schneider and Lukas Ballis, which provides you with basically everything you need to start becoming a deep learning numerics researcher. It comes with a bunch of test problems, actually quite a few, of varying complexity from very simple and small that you can try out quickly to very complicated large-scale problems. It provides you with benchmarks with other quantities to compare to, other optimizers, so that you don't have to run the experiments yourself, so that you can't screw them up, and so that you can save time not having to run things that other people have already done for you. And if you really want to save time, this algorithm, just to like put a cherry on top, this, this package actually provides you with the LaTeX toolchain to produce the final two pages of your paper. It even adds the plots you need to show you to your community and to the machine learning community that you've written an algorithm that actually performs well on reasonable test problems. With that, thank you very much for your attention and let's make uncertainty in the computational setting, computational uncertainty, a quantity, a problem to be studied properly also by the applied math community. Thank you.